You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 11, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Adverse Reactions to Food and Drug Additives. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's an Allergy Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. This morning is going to be about adverse reactions to foods and, and drugs, and drug additives, uh, and it's going to be given by uh, Dr. Raji, who's one of our second year allergy uh, fellows. So uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Raji, and uh, All right, so I'm going to pre uh, present today Sola on adverse reactions to food and drug additives. Yeah. I have no disclosures. Objectives of my talk are to know the clinical presentation of food and drug additive adverse reactions, to formulate a diagnostic plan in case of suspected uh, reaction to additives, know the treatment options in these cases, and to know the common drugs and uh, food and drug additives that cause adverse reactions. So here's the pretest. Epinephrine should not be given to a patient with sulfite sensitivity. True or false? Second question, hypersensitivity reactions secondary to additives can be reliably diagnosed by a skin test, um, LCAT, reading food labels, or none of the above. All of the following dyes are primarily yellow, except carmine, curcumin, saffron, chartreuse, and um, turmeric. All right. I'm sure they're all delicious. <laughs> so additives are substances that are added to food and pharmaceutical products for a wide variety of technical functions. FDA publishes a small volume that's called because everything added to food in, in the United States that lists 2,922 2, substances allowed to be added uh, to these uh, to the foods in the United States. Uh, but this was from 2007, so I think it, the number has gone about 3,000, I think. Approximately, approximately 773 chemical agents are approved for use in drug products by FDA. Um, but this volume actually has a disclaimer that there are some additives that are not listed here and are not needed to be um, not needed to be um, listed on the ingredient list. Uh, additives are typically minor ingredients of the composite food, whereas the inactive ingredient often compromises the majority part of the pharmaceutical product. The prevalence of the adverse reactions to the additives is estimated to be less than 1% in adults, while it's 2% in children, and then it's higher in children with ATP. So the common food uh, additive categories are antioxidants, dyes and colorings, there are emulsifiers, there are flavorings, which include MSG, spices, sweeteners, preservatives, and stabilizers. Um, the common drug additives are um, uh, uh, are either encapsulation agents, emulsifying agents, <laughs> synthetic sweetness um, uh, sweetness adders, vapor, uh, stabilizing agents, and antioxidants, dyes, preservatives, and adjuvants. So this is just a table from one of the articles that um, categorizes the food dyes by color, which I think is more useful than just saying natural and synthetic. Uh, so as you can see, there are, there are blue, green, orange, red, yellow, and uh, it, the common name is listed here, but they uh, go by, the, uh, by number two. So there is blue number one, blue number two, similarly yellow number six, yellow number five. So these are the names that are common. Uh, are the numbers uh, in order of when they were developed? I'm or? not sure. No, I'm not, I don't know how they, they number them. But it, it looks like red number 40. I don't think know, there's the like 40, 39 right? other reds in there. Or? <laughs> we never see the other reds. Maybe they're they're not as good. Or there's a one company that 
controls that. Mm. And that's where the numbers come from, I think. Oh, okay. And I have the names of the companies in my presentation. If those, because the additives, we can get those additives for testing from them, but I don't know if it's the same company that you're talking about. But I'll go over that. So we'll talk about the labeling of food and drug additives. So the ingredient statement, li uh, statement lists all the ingredients in the composite food product in the descending order of predominance by weight. All intentionally added ingredients must be declared as per FDA rule. Um, a few group of ingredients are allowed to be declared collectively without you listing all the individual components. And these are spices, natural flavors, artificial flavors. Any ingredient derived from a commonly allergenic food has to be labeled clearly by the source. So if, it's, if the flavor is from egg or fish or so all common eight allergenic foods have to be including the flavor, but the other ingredients also have to mention the source. Um, there are some exemptions to this rule and uh, those are for highly refined oils and the ingredients that are exempted by notification or petition to FDA. But from what I what I read, none of those exemption, none of the notifications or petitions were actually approved by FDA so far. Um, so let's talk about the clinical and diagnostic appro approach, which is the most interesting for uh, all of um, our department. So um, when to suspect a reaction from additive? When there is a history of reactions to several unrelated foods, or if a patient reacts to a certain food when commercially prepared, but not when it is homemade. So the symptoms reported are general allergic symptoms like dermatological GI and respiratory symptoms, but then they can come in with um, kind of non-IgE uh, symptoms, like mus they can be musculoskeletal symptoms, uh, just dizziness and headache, or someone may say numbness and parathesias. They can come in with uh, palpitations and tachycardia like or other cardiovascular symptoms or just uh, non-specific ones like lacrimation or trembling. Enough I like to list it there. But. So what would be the next step if we, are, if we have a patient of, uh, that fits that picture? So the first um, step would still, what's that? Mm -hmm. oh, Those are the slides, mm -hmm. handouts. All right. Thank you. Um, so the next step is would be still to rule out the food protein allergy uh, because um, some of so if a patient comes in saying um, we ate this food commercially prepared it he did react but he had not reacted previously to the homemade food but the first step would be still to go ahead and test for the the whole food rather than like wheat or eggs or rather than thinking about the additive. The second step would be to rule out hidden food allergy. So for some cases, uh, it would mean sending the food for analysis in a specialized lab. I'm not sure if we know of any, any specific mm, lab that does it. Kind of hard to the do. The authors have done it, and yeah, so I don't know, specific, but it's mm. hard. Uh, and then the other uh, option would be to contact the source of the food, so rest, if, whether it's a restaurant or a manufacturer, so you would contact them and, and ask them about the ingredient. Um, and then uh, another example of this would be uh, of a food in, uh, hidden food allergy would be uh, an egg allergic child who eats a processed food that contains lecithin derived from egg but just with lecithin. But from newer FDA rules, the food should actually mention the source egg. So sh now it shouldn't be a problem, but earlier I think this must, must, must have been an issue. So the common foods that may be incorporated under, under the unfamiliar names are uh, listed here. So milk may be mentioned as just lactose or hydrolyzed proteins or just flavor. So it has milk in it, but uh, hopefully they should mention the sources with it. Same for soy, um, wheat, and uh, it, wheat it may just say starch, peanut it may just say oil. So very non-specific. Um, for fish, it may just say gelatin. So there is just fish gelatin, uh, gelatin that is from the fish. It's the kosher uh, gelatin from what I understand. And then uh, eggs, it may just say lecithin or lysozyme or flavor. So the next step would be if those things are ruled out, then you suspect a food additive allergy. 
and um, uh, for, uh, for the diagnosis for the natural additive, you could use the skin testing or in vitro testing. Um, from the studies that, couple of studies that I read, the skin testing was just done by getting the additive and um, put, uh, adding saline to it and doing a skin trick. Um, some of them just use extra controls, but I don't have more information on the skin testing. You'd have to do, um, you don't we'll know what the irritant reaction is unless someone's already right. figured that out. So you'd, you'd have to do serial dilutions and yourself and some controls and the patient or whatever to be able to make it easy. Yeah, yeah, do it on a non-allergic control just to make sure it's not an irritant sure. reaction. Yeah, and then that's the reason um, the diagnosis so, is so difficult because there's not a good test that we have so far. So for synthetic additives, the skin testing is not even something that's considered so considered as an option. So um, there, a trial of additive-free diet is uh, helps in diagnosis, and then a series of oral challenges, which should be blinded and placebo controlled helps. So uh, for uh, we'll talk about the additive-free diet. So here is a list of um, instructions that you could give the patients. So these are some uh, additive-free foods. But here is a list of what to avoid, and I was surprised to see apples and bananas and uh, grapes and just foods that you wouldn't think, but look like everything has some kind of additive in there. Um, don't eat <laughs> well, unless it's grown yeah. in an organic farm yeah. where they don't put things, but they'll they'll put they'll spray things on the fruits and and so on as a to keep and, and a lot down. and a lot goes in in the canning process. I mean, you know, you, you see these beautiful yellow peaches. In the jar, in the in the store, you know, they come out gorgeous yellow. That's not natural. No, that did not come off the tree. Gorgeous <laughs> yellow. It's yellow because they put a yellow coloring in it. Mm -hmm. And the, the I mean, the apples and bananas. Is that is that natural or processed? It's, it's probably the stuff they spray the trees with to keep the insects off, and it gets into the peel of the apple. Yeah, and they put and then they put wax around. You know, if they're, if you're going to store an apple. You cut it with a fine layer of, a very thin layer of wax. Well, why bananas? You peel them. Yeah, you peel them. So, I don't know. They were on the list. I, I just uh, mm -hmm. I wish I had more information. But, um, yeah. I but the others are processed foods, so you would, you know, you can, you can buy the other ones then. You have to avoid beer? Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> So if you consider doing an oral food additive challenge, that which would which is advised, um, the, here is some information on that. So they should be blinded, placebo controlled, and for some of the uh, some of the challenges, you might want to consider multiple placebo steps that are interspersed with the active agent in between active agents. Um, uh, um, the author of the sorry, I mentioned. It's the same uh, same review article from Dr. Bana, and he says that mixtures of the additives should be used initially. So that may be dyes of a similar color, uh, several different gums, sweeteners, or preservatives can be added together and used at the same time. And then components of the positive challenge mixture can then be tested individually. When you are doing these challenges, um, consider that you, you would have to consider the continuation versus stopping of the medications, especially in cases where you are doing it for chronic urticaria patients or severe asthma patients. Um, and um, there's a whole discussion in Middleton's about um, how chronic urticaria patients, if you stop the antihistaminics completely, what would happen is they stop it like. 24 to 48 hours early, and then uh, they would just have a um, breakthrough of the arctic area, and it would be a false positive. So instead of completely stopping the antihistaminics, you might want to you might want to first uh, establish a baseline of um, how how much and like how much what dose of antihistaminic can keep them uh, relatively stable arctic area, not completely resolved, but uh, just tolerable, and then um, not stop it and just continue that because uh, otherwise it's just hard to <coughs> it in these patients. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in severe asthma; they need to be uh, their asthma needs to be stable enough to interpret the results because otherwise they're just going to have an episode and it's not it might not be related to the um, challenge itself. 
So here are a couple of websites and official scientific and Sigma Aldrich are a couple of companies that are, that were mentioned where you can get uh, the additives. You just contact them and ask for them. And I know someone who had that just got those additives, like all colored um, additives that they send out for that no. for adjustments. Another trick is um, sometimes if there's a manufactured food, there's a lot of different additives. If you notice, if you contact the company, <coughs> tell them that you're an allergist and you have a patient who's concerned about a possible reaction. A lot of times the manufacturers have little kits that they can send you that have one of each thing that's in that that's food, exactly. and so you, and I've received those and they're very helpful because you get a little packet of all the different stuff and then you don't have to go out and, and try to gather them for yourself. Sure. Sure. Plus, you know that that's the exact stuff that's in the food too, so it may not, it won't be a different, you know, brand or version of it. And uh, these are some of the doses that were uh, that are uh, mentioned for each of these additives, and uh, the dose increments have been mentioned. So, uh, as you can see, for some, uh, so for most of these uh, additives, most of the preservatives, I think. Uh, uh, dose it goes up to 200 milligrams, whereas uh, for food additives and color, uh, colorants, uh, it's pretty low. But as you can see, like MSG, it goes up to like 16, 1600, and there have been challenges done up to like a, a cumulative dose of like three grams or something like that. So, mm -hmm. one more. So, as I mentioned, the first step would be to establish a stable baseline for urticaria or asthma patients prior to the challenge. Uh, but then there, there are very, there are several challenges that might have to be uh, done in these patients. So the first step would be to do a single uh, line placebo control challenge. And if there are no objective findings on two of these, uh, then likely the food additive is not related to the symptoms. If objective findings are found on one or both of those uh, times, then double blind placebo control food challenge uh, should be. Uh, uh, should be pursued. And then if uh, if there are no objective findings, no urticaria or no wheezing, but there is just a subjective finding like pruritus, then actually the challenge may be, uh, uh, should be repeated about with three active agents and three placebo agents. Uh, so the next step, if, the, if we find that there are objective findings on single blind placebo control challenge, then the next step would be a double blind placebo control challenge. Um, uh, and if that's positive with food agent and negative with placebo, then you could have a presenter diagnosis of uh, adverse reaction to that additive. But you may want to repeat the challenge if it's uh, if it if you are ha if you do consider a presenter diagnosis because um, just to ensure consistency and reproducibility of that challenge. Um, if the, uh, if there is a negative blind challenge, then last open feed uh, is recommended just to make sure that it, it's still consistent. Uh, whereas uh, it, it mentions that if during these challenges, if the challenge is equivocal then a third challenge they may be required. And that can be just placebo. So if it's double blind, just placebo, or just control, uh, just the active agent can be used during that challenge. No, I don't quite understand. If, the, if you have a negative blind challenge, so if you do, so do you say, here's the food now that you can eat? Yeah. Well, if the blind challenge is negative, then they're not then reacting. So you want to prove that, that it really isn't, so you just yeah. give them yeah. some more. But it's then you openly give it and you say, here is the food. We gave it to you, to you for the challenge. You you pass that part, so the last part would be to go ahead and tell them that this is not a placebo. Yeah, so if the blind challenge is negative, but then you but then they eat the food and their mouth itches or whatever the symptoms are, what, how do you interpret that? Does that mean that it's a psychological, psychological reaction? reaction. The, the patient will probably say it's probably The patient won't like that, but let's say it's so dependent or something. I, I have a problem with that. I think that you're open. You're opening yourself some problems. Well, I know, but obviously it's a very complicated situation, and this may be the best way to try to figure it out. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's just a protocol for um, sulfite challenge that has been mentioned, and it just goes through the steps mm. for single single blind mm. challenge. So how they, you you have you might want to withhold the medications. If you decide to, uh, if you decide to hold them, versus for some asthma patients, you might have to actually give them a course of oral steroids or inhaled steroids for 
of of ECOR2 before the challenge so that they are stable before the, during the challenge. And then um, three FTs need to be performed before and after every step uh, of the challenge. And then if there are symptoms, uh, an extra uh, PFD uh, reading should be done. So those are for patients that have asthma, not for? Right. And this is a sulfide challenge. So this is for uh, the, this. This particular protocol is for sulfide, so this is for asthma. So how would you interpret, in these patients for, with chronic urticaria or asthma, how would you interpret the results? So for chronic urticaria, they use a rule of nine. So you, uh, like for burns, they have, there's nine percent for each area of the body. And then you score one through four. So one is 25 percent of the body surface area is involved. 2 is 50 percent, 3 is 75 percent, and 4 is confluence of the urticaria in any of these areas. Uh, and then positive challenge would be when there is a score of 9 or 30 percent increase from the baseline urticaria. So it's in general, I think these challenges are hard to uh, interpret, but this is some, some sort of guideline where you can start. And then in asthma, 20% decrease in FEV1 from baseline is a positive challenge. If you have someone who is doing a challenge who has a history of, of urticaria, and um, patients, especially patients with chronic urticaria, are more likely to be flared with heat or stress or whatever, so you have someone who's worried <laughs> that they have a bad reaction to what you're feeding them, and they have chronic urticaria, uh, I'm not sure that having a some extra highs with chronic urticaria if, if they typically will have uh, cholinergic urticaria kind of thing um, is going to be very helpful. So that's the reason for the multiple placebo steps uh, because they say that even like con instead of considering the first step as placebo for these patients you might want to consider giving them active agent first and then in between just give a placebo say you could do that and then there are uh, other protocols which mention do the placebo one full day. You just do placebo, then the second day you do, act or like either or. You can. Do I, I, I could see so. doing, you know, like placebo for like the first two or three steps. But when you give a placebo and then and and say or give the extra and say they don't do anything, you placebo. Well, maybe at the end of the placebo, they actually absorb it now and then they have a reaction. So right. It's, yeah, it's all. Yeah. It's, it's why you have to do multiple different ones. It's got to be double blind because the person doing the grading, the physician, might be biased also. So if everyone's blinded and it's placebo controlled, and you can have random placebos <laughs> and have every other one, then it's too predictable. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way to do it. Some of these can be just very challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so then the management is avoidance of the, those additives if we decide that that additive really caused the adverse reaction. All the names that are that refer to that additive and the potential product that might include it should be provided to the patient. Uh, they should be advised to read the labels and ask questions about the commercially prepared foods. Uh, homemade food with defined ingredients, if possible, should be advised. And then medical bracelets, self-injectable epinephrine for severe reactions. So uh, now I'm going to go into the details about like several different additives and uh, the reason I'm doing that is there are some uh, key points for some of the commonly implicated additives. So this is uh, yellow number five, so tartrazine. So it is a uh, synthetic uh, synthetic additive. Uh, the estimated prevalence uh, was, was 0 to 0.12 percent. So pretty low prevalence and these prevalence were estimated from a population survey that was done um, from the, the uh, it was it was done the survey was done for a combination of additives. So it's not particularly for tartrazine. So it's not the exact prevalence of each uh, for that specific one. Um, but tartrazine was one of them. And then um, Tartrazin is especially reported to be a problem in asthma and chronic urticaria patients. There are reports of sensi sensitivity in aspirin-sensitive asthma, but uh, as as you can um, see, you know these testing t tests and challenges are hard to interpret, and there is no compelling evidence for the role of tartrazin, uh, specifically in angioedema, 
but case reports have been uh, case re there are case reports that mention angioedema. Uh, few studies looked at mixtures of food colors and atopic dermatitis, uh, but they didn't particularly. So it was a mixture, but it did have tartrus in, in it. Um, there have been case, cases that have been reported for, with purpura. Mm -hmm. This was all the rage in the early 1980s, the tartrazine. We used to do lots of tartrazine challenges. It was in Tang, which is in synthetic orange mm -hmm. juice. Mm -hmm. And um, rarely saw anybody react to it, but we, we did tons of challenges because it, it was one of those things that became a fad in the early right. 80s. Mm -hmm. It's kind of gone out of style now, I suppose. And I don't even know you can buy Tang anymore. Well, what do the astronauts drink then? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Back in the water, sorry. So, um, so lo all these clinics, there are a lot of them, and sorry, I didn't list them. There are like several different ones, uh, clinical trials that have been mentioned for tartrazine and some other uh, additives, and they are full of flaws. So, either the antihistaminics were completely withheld, or bronchodilators uh, were withheld during the, uh, prior to the challenge in asthma. Um, they were non-blinded challenges, and uh, some of them used one placebo step, and it was administered as the first step in the challenge. So those are considered flaws for the food additive challenges, and so most of these studies are not something that would be um, that would be considered good evidence. Uh, routine exclusion from the diet of asthma patients is no longer recommended. So this is another one, yellow, num yellow number six, sunset yellow, and it's implicated in urticaria, in geodema, same methodological flaws in the studies. Studies looking at atopic dermatitis used food additive mixture with sunset yellow. Uh, it was one of the 22 additives, so hard to interpret. It has been implicated in childhood asthma and monkey <coughs> purpura and orofacial granulomatosis. So there are other synthetic colors, and they are all implicated in all these urticaria and geodema, asthma, atopic dermatitis. No convincing studies were found. Um, so um, I think this is just a list that goes on, but there are some which did have, so for example, erythrocin, uh, there was persistent rhinitis in seven patients when they were challenged. So there were some here. There is another one that was confirmed by placebo-controlled oral challenge with 50 milligrams of, of points you read for R. So there are some which were, uh, but they are still just case reports. So. Some natural food additives, uh, anato, it's an extract from the seeds of a fruit from, uh, fruit of the Central and um, South American tree, Bixa orellana, and Bixin is a keratinite that is a principal pigment. It's red in color, but it is used to impart an orange or deep yellow color. And prevalence is, again, uh, very low. Uh, there has been a report of IgE-mediated reaction, and this patient presented with injury edema, urticaria, severe hypotension within 20 minutes of ingesting a breakfast cereal that had anato, and it was confirmed by a strongly positive skin test. Now, the skin test, again, it's an issue how to interpret it, but it was positive. And then it, they, they did show that IgE binding protein was identified by um, electrophoresis. I have and two patients that have um, allergies to anato. Um, and they had um, classic symptoms. We were able to, to figure it out from the labeling of the packages. Did, um, I didn't do skin tests. I didn't know we could get that. But um, did, you can order it through um, IBT or whatever it's called on ViroCore. And um, they were both positive. IG? Yeah, IG oh, okay. was positive. Yeah. But both these kiddos had, um, had basically classic. They had the food and within 15 minutes had swelling or hives or whatever. Yeah. And they changed. And, um, one girl, it was she was she would drink milk with eye problems. She had certain types of cheeses. Mom brought in the different labels from the different cheeses because like some of the cheeses had anato with the colorant in them to make them more yellow, and some didn't. And then she had like mom had made like um, I don't know, like scalloped potatoes, but she got a box of those freeze dried potato things in the package of the cheese mix or whatever, and and gave her that, and she broke out with that as well. And we looked at all the labels and everything. the cheeses she didn't react to. Um, didn't have an auto, but the one she did had an auto in it. So yeah. should we have a food coloring panel for IgE testing? So the only the only two that that I'm aware of that are that are um, that are um, plant or 
um, you know, the, the carmines from ground up insects, but that are protein based, I guess I should say, um, um, are uh, carmine, um, which is the red dye, and an auto yellow dye. And then it's, uh, there's a quinolone thing that I think is also plant derived or something. Well, we'll find out more about it. But so there aren't enough to make a panel because the panel would need to be more than one or two items. So. And, okay. and it is so individualized that you would have to actually just look at the ingredient list and find out which one did they, uh, they were consuming. So. So carmine, as you mentioned, carmine and cochineal extract are derived from dried female insects of the species that tylo, that coccus, uh, costa, that lives as a parasite on the prickly pear uh, cactus. It's red in color, widely used in cosmetics, apart from food and beverages. And the carminic acid is the main ingredient, main principle, the principal ingredient. The so, uh, few cases of dermatological reactions and one case of severe anaphylactic shock were attributed to just the cosmetic use, um, but there was no follow-up, so again, not a good evidence. Uh, occupational asthma has been reported, and this was a confirmed case by oral challenge. Numerous cases of anaphylaxis reported from ingestion of foods and beverages containing um, carmine. Just things we don't do, like when they come in saying they are allergic to red dye, most of the times we, uh, is it because they are consuming something else that ha has that and we don't do challenges enough or not pursue it or, I'm not sure. Is there, so there is an action for this? Yeah, there is for Carmine. Yeah, and actually um, I've seen at the college or academy meeting a couple of posters where people have, um, have had patients that have had reactions. They've gotten the Carmine test and did IG to it positive and had you know, and I they documented IG reaction to it, and you know, case they had like four or five cases that they had had or something. Yeah, I've I've seen it. I had one patient who had an IG that was elevated to carmine and in an obvious reaction on ingestion. But um, the the thing is, as you said, it's 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 not just necessarily something with a red color because it can be in a bunch of different things. Sure, yeah. and I had a, a patient, uh, and we never figured it out. But this patient, there was some kind of some kind of this fruit energy drink that this person was, was drinking and there were like, let's say, five different flavors and most of the ingredients were the same but there were some different things and, and actually a couple of them had carmine, a couple didn't and um, this person would, could drink like one of these but had problems with two or three others or something. We tried figuring this out and looking at carmine stuff and, we, and that wasn't positive, at least not with the, the IgE testing and um, it, was just, it was just bizarre because um, we, you know, you just go through every little ingredient to try to figure out what's different, and is, is, can you test for that? And is it, you know, would it make a difference or not? But. So next one is sulfites. Um, so sulfites are used in a lot of foods. Um, the, there are different kinds of functions that it uh, serves in different foods. So it inhibits enzymatic grounding, non-enzymatic grounding, antimicrobial action, dough condition, uh, conditioning, and antioxidant action, leaching effect. So used in a lot of different foods as well as actually beverages. And then it's also used in drugs. So EpiPen, Twinject, Epinephrine, Adrenaline, Adrenaline, everything has some sulfite in it. Um, as you can see, some injectable corticosteroids have it. Combivent has it. Sorry, protoprim albutrol has it, no, nasal corticosteroids have it, so a lot of uh, drugs have it too. And that, that's a partial list, so if that's not like a comprehensive list of drugs. So most of the times you would just have to look at the package insert to, uh, to, check, uh, to check for it. So but the um, sulfite level, uh, it, it can vary from less than 10 to more than 100 uh, parts per million. And uh, as you can see, there are foods here listed which have very high amounts of sulfite and then 50 to 99 and then 10 to 49 and less than 10. So long list of um, foods which have different levels of sulfite. So level of sulfites in drugs is um, very low. Uh, two primary uses in drugs is antioxidant or uh, prevention of non-enzymatic grounding and then paradoxical bronchoconstriction has been reported. Uh, from the sulfites in bronchodilators. Uh, sulfites uh, have also no, known to cause contact sensitivity, you know, 
and um, urticaria injury edema has been reported. There was a study of 75 patients with chronic urticaria or anaphylaxis. Um, they did not show any positive reactions on blind challenges and the doses went up to 200 milligrams of metabisulfite. So again, some of these challenges, um, they haven't shown promising uh, evidence. Uh, anaphylaxis and similar symptoms have been noted, hypertension and abdominal mentioned distress, so abdominal symptoms were noted. There is a risk of severe bronchoconstriction, um, hypertension, loss of consciousness, fatal reactions, especially in severe asthma, persist, severe persistent asthma patients. And uh, the prevalence has been shown to be like uh, of the, the bronchoconstriction in about 4% of all asthma patients, but it is more in severe or steroid dependent asthmatics. So um, again, the diagnosis depends on you could do skin prick and it, even intradermal test has been mentioned. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's as uh, validated. Uh, sulfite agent challenges can be done by using capsules or uh, solutions. And the capsule challenge is preferable it's because it's a bound form compared to the, uh, the, sol the sol sol I mean the soluble form of um, uh, sulfite. And solutions are mainly considered if someone is reacting to beverages like sulfited wines. So FDA banned the use of sulfites in fresh, uh, fresh foods and required that any food or beverage that contains more than uh, 10, level of 10 sulfites, it had to be declared on the label. Um, sulfite sensitive asthmatics should avoid uh, foods that have more than 100 uh, uh, level of sulfite equivalence and then less than 10 is not usually uh, a problem. Um, avoidance in re restaurants is more difficult because most of the potato products are all sulfited except for the baked potatoes with intact skin. So something that might be educational for the patients if there is an, a patient of that kind. The, 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 um, I can't, the only time I can remember any time recently seeing any label on a package that sulfite um, was like a bottle of wine, but I mean, because of my heart problems, now I read every label, uh, right, right. and I can't tell you, I, I can't, I haven't seen any label of stuff that I've had that it says it has sulfites, so they must all have less than 10 parts per right. whatever. So Pretty much different. there was an epidemic of sulfite in the early 80s. Um, it led to this these measures, and <laughs> since the sulfites have been pretty much taken out of foods now and alternatives, and you don't see it anymore. Yeah, I mean, when would the, you all probably will never see a sulfite-sensitive individual. We used to see them all the time. They were very common. So it's, it's another example of how modifying what we do to foods has really made an improvement in the health of our patients. At least it was like the salad bar syndrome or something. Like yeah, it's got the bear it would like pies. <laughs> People yeah. would just yeah, you have a salad bar that with you know, veggies and lettuce and something like that, and, and it would turn brown after it had been out there four or five hours. If you sprayed it with sulfite before you, after you, right after you yeah. put it out, it wouldn't turn brown for maybe 10 hours. It right. would out a long time. Right. So, so that's yeah. what the next one is. So sulfite and lettuce <laughs> was actually <laughs> banned in NYC, yeah. but it was the salad bar syndrome, what they call them. You know, basically lettuce yeah. has free form of sulfite in it, so that was a big major problem. Do you know if there's a difference in the level of sulfites between like a red versus a white wine? Uh, it's mostly the red wines that have the I sulfites in them. The well, I don't but the sulfite is used as a sterilant, and and they sort of use it indiscriminately. It, it comes in little tablets of metabi potassium metabisulfite, and basically, even if you're making homemade wine, you put in one tablet per gallon, and so the big manufacturers are just dumping in bags of the stuff right as it goes in the bottle. It sterilizes the bottle, which means you don't get something nasty growing in your wine. And uh, the sulfite level is typically very low, but it's almost impossible to find a bottle of wine that does not say it has sulfites in it. If you hear a patient like complain about um, significant flushing after consuming something with sulfites, how would you categorize that reaction? Do you just say that that's just an adverse reaction, or, or just I mean, like a just change? flushing? Yeah, flushing and maybe breaking out. It's probably the alcohol. A lot of people do that with wine, though. So. Yeah, it's probably not the sulfite. Sulfite's more a respiratory, like asthma. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, a person with sulfite sensitivity generally gets short of breath. Okay. There is a there is an alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the alcohol that's doing it. Because uh, what happens with the sulfites is it 
gets converted into sulfuric acid or SO2, sulfur dioxide, not sulfuric acid. Well, that becomes sulfuric acid in water. Your sulfurous, sulfurous acid, and then you exhale it. And so if you, have, if you have asthma and you're exhaling sulfurous acid, that's clearly not a good thing. But if you metabolize it very slowly, it gets exhaled at a very low concentration, so it's not likely to trigger an asthma episode. Uh, but if you have this certain enzyme allele, I don't know if you're going to mention this, uh, there's a certain allele of the enzyme that breaks down the metabisulfites uh, very rapidly, and so suddenly you get this massive exhalation of sulfurous acid, and that's what triggered the uh, asthma episodes. So there was a specific enzyme allele that uh, was associated with the sulfite syndrome. Mm -hmm. I read about it, but I don't know if there was a name mentioned, and then I didn't mention because it's yeah, they used to sell sulfa strips, these little strips that sulfite-sensitive individuals would take to restaurants, and you could dip it in your food, and if it would turn a color to tell you if there was a lot of sulfite in your food or not, it was, mm. it, it got to that's, be that, it was yeah, that, that bad. bad. Yeah, <laughs> but people were using a lot of sulfite back then. Yeah. I mean, you know, you get... You didn't know that it was a problem. Yeah, you know, it came in a spray bottle. <laughs> hey, Jay? Jay, I, I think... Up? With regard to the flushing from wine, it's probably due to histamine. Uh, wines have quite a bit of histamine in it, and particularly mm. in Asians, they get uh, the flush with just a few sips of uh, wine. Yeah, the histamine is a big issue, but also uh, in Asians tend not to have uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. Their enzyme right. is, uh, they have an allele that metabolizes it very slowly, so they get the flushing, and that's... That's something that 23andMe can actually tell you if you're going to flush with alcohol because of the alcohol dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and then, uh, yeah, so one more thing. I don't know if anyone does it because food challenges for different sulfited foods can be done to check tolerance. So some people can tolerate some sulfited foods but not others. So you could do a variety of challenges and say, okay, now you can tolerate these foods, not these foods. But I think that could be really time consuming. Um, so, uh, avoid drugs with sulfites. In case of bronchoconstriction, non-sulfited bronchodilators should be preferred. Um, however, the epinephrine has sulfites to retain its potency, uh, but no, there have been no reported paradoxical reactions, mm -hmm. and epinephrine should never be denied or avoided in sulfite-sensitive asthma patients, as it can, or any other patient, as it can uh, prove life-saving. So the next one is monosodium glutamate, and it occurs virtually in all foods um, used as a flavor enhancer. Um, there, there was a link to asthma with MSG. 29 cases were reported. Only one was confirmed by double-blind placebo control challenge. Um, there was a study with 30 subjects with positive history, 70 with no history, and none of them had 20% change in FAV1. So this was asthma, like asthma patients. So. Um, urticaria, study of 65 patients, none confirmed by challenge, atopic dermatitis, two patients were reported and they were actually confirmed by double blind placebo control challenge. Orofacial granulomatosis uh, case was reported but there was no challenge done. And there is a Chinese restaurant syndrome, um, typical symptoms, burning sensation in the back of the neck, forearm chest, facial pressure, chest pain, headaches, nausea tingling weakness, palpitation, numbness, and then bronchospasm, mainly in asthmatic patients, and drowsiness. Um, the MSG, this is a MSG complex that has never been complete, con uh, completely confirmed. Um, if it does occur, it mostly is from the studies, it's mostly at doses that are really high, uh, which are most, mostly not used in as I mean, it, it may be used in the food, but your portion wouldn't be enough to give you that amount of MSG. A group of uh, 226 patients with persistent rhinitis were evaluated by a double line placebo control challenge after a month of additive-free diet. And challenges with up to 400 milligrams of MSG, MSG elicited both objective and subjective symptoms of rhinitis together with uh, some nasal peak and spiritual flow rate re reduction. Um, so th there is this one study which just shows symptoms, like if someone, suggests, if someone comes in saying they do have rhinitis, but <coughs> um, flavors are uh, another uh, additive. They contain one flavoring. If it mentions flavoring, it makes hundreds of different compounds. 
uh, IgE-mediated reactions are likely from the source allergy. So um, mostly are reported from the ones that have data from milk or peanuts, and but the, the milk and or peanut was not mentioned on the label. Um, there also contact sensitization of oral cavity uh, has been reported from products like chewing gums, uh, toothpaste, candy, cigarettes, ginger products. Um, and there are some other um, uh, flavorings like uh, in, in nice oil, cinnamon, peppermint, spe uh, spearmint, menthol, um, but the big one is balsam of Peru that can cause contact sensitization. So there are some others. I'm just going to shortly go over the, the rest of other additives. So aspartame is um, a sweetener. It has been reported to uh, um, give headaches, neuropsychiatric symptoms, urticaria, and edema, not confirmed. Uh, protein hydrosphalates makes sense, uh, some of it makes sense, typically processed from the protein sections of uh, the, uh, the source foods, and then varying degree of hydrolysis um, is seen, and then high degree of hydrolysis is, uh, is seen in flavoring, so mostly it's not a problem, but it could be. So casein and wave hydrosylates are seen in infant formula. And then there is one case of uh, contact dermatitis from uh, protein hydrosylates in hair conditioner that was uh, reported. Parabens and benzoates, whole another um, topic. Uh, it's, it's found in pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. <coughs> A lot of it's a well recognized reaction contact dermatitis to parabens and that found, that has been seen in shampoos, the eye drops, and sunscreen use. Chronic urticaria and geoedema, contact urticaria, anaphylaxis, rhinitis, all of these have been reported. Uh, same for sorbate, it's a food preservative. It prevents mold formation. It's less commonly implicated, but there are a lot of symptoms that have been reported. Uh, no good studies. BHA and BHT, uh, they are antioxidants. A um, lot of studies for a lot of different symptoms that have been mentioned, but um, most of these didn't show any reaction in the, the patients. Two of the patients with asthma did react in a double-blind placebo control uh, challenge. Nitrites and uh, nitrates, one case of anaphylaxis um, that was confirmed, and then um, there was another one which, which was pruritus that was uh, that did react. So there are some other uh, additives like lecithin, um, uh, lecithin that's from soy, eggs, sunflower that can give symptom, uh, symptoms. Pepain is a meat tenderizer, tendinizer, and it, there was an IgE mediated reaction that was reported. Um, the study showed that the reaction was in pollen allergic patient, uh, patients, but not in the, uh, the, the patients who are not allergic to pollen. I'm not sure if that word makes sense. Um, so, and then there are gums that have been uh, that are a known cause of occupational asthma, and there have been IgE-mediated reactions that were reported. Uh, gelatin uh, from pork and beef, and there is gelatin from uh, the kosher gelatin from fish skin. Um, most of the times, the vaccine reactions that have been reported from gelatin uh, from gelatin are from pork and beef. Uh, but both IgE-mediated and cell-mediated reactions have been reported. Inulin is in a lot of, uh, in several uh, foods like um, uh, artichokes and um, other, uh, I don't know if they're vegetables or fruits, but IgE-mediated reaction has been reported that was confirmed. And then there are there is lactose, wheat charge, edible oils. Most of the reactions that were um, that were confirmed were because these foods were sent for analysis, and they had the source food uh, that the patient was allergic to. Um, benzyl alconium chloride, or PAC, is a preservative in albutrol nebulizer solution, beclomethazone and erythrochem nebulizer solution, but I think it's in the other countries and not here. And then nasal steroid saline, nasal saline and nasal decongestants have it too. And paradoxical bronchoconstriction by non-Ig mediated reaction has been seen. Um, benzyl alcohol, propylene glycol have caused, uh, have caused contact dermatitis. That should be. Mm -hmm. So, post test, epinephrine should not be given to a patient with sulfite sensitivity. Uh, hypersensitivity reactions secondary to additives can be reliably diagnosed by. Um, 
And all of the following dyes are primarily yellow except carmine. Hey, carmine. Bugs. Ah. Beetle. Bugs. So if somebody is allergic to peanut, can they take a nebulizer solution with soy lecithin in it? Um, I I know it has been mentioned in there. Scholarship will be held today at 12 o'clock in conference room A and B on the 10th floor. Academic scholarship will be held today at 12 o'clock. Can we have a speaker that works in this room? Can we turn it off? Thank you. Oh, well. Oh, well. Never mind. That was a speaker that's in this conference room. So soy lecithin is in uh, ipotropium bromide right. nebulizer right. and maybe some of the other nebulizers. So I know there have been, like, there are people who say, oh, I'm allergic to peanut and I can't have uh, ipotropium, but I don't know. I, I was under the impression it was in the puffer but not in the nebulizer. In the inhaler. Uh, it's an emulsifier. It's a, it's a fat. And... Um, uh, it's from soy, which is not peanut, so there's never any risk at all, but there was just sort of this peripheral... Because there are another lagoon, which the cross track is in. Um, so it was oh, all this theoretical the stuff that oh, never happened. I never heard anything. So, I mean, lecithin, I mean, it all depends on how much you purify it. You With purify the soy, it it's right. soy lecithin, not soy everything. Soy is in everything, isn't it? Was that? I mean, soy is in so much stuff. Yeah. You know, allergic people, I've never heard of anybody it's saying... It's purified lecithin, it's the fat, it's not the, the fat. Protein. We very rare for you. We, like in the hospital here, we had this, I think Jay was part of this, but there was a concern when patients came in and, and the, the, caf the uh, cafeteria was trying to feed the patients on the floors that if they had, they listed, you know, they're allergic to soy, there was so many processed foods that had soy lecithin in them, and they basically decided that you know, even if you had anaphylaxis to soy, that that the that soy lecithin for the most part was fine. They weren't going to worry about it. Depends on how yeah. purified it is. But yeah. For the most part, if they're going to put it in a drug, it's going to be pretty fairly, great, fairly well purified. Papain is an interesting one. It's an enzyme that digests proteins, a protease, and uh, they used to use it for uh, endonucleolysis. Remember the people with the the disc disease in their lower back, yeah, they, they would dissolve. Like they would inject it with papain to dissolve the disc to try to fix their lower back pain. It, I don't think it worked, and they they no longer do that. But back in the early 1980s, I, I keep referring to the early 80s. That's when I was a fellow. So that's what I know about. And and they used to inject that into people, and then those people would either have anaphylaxis or more commonly chronic urticaria. Uh, as a consequence of an IgE reaction to the papain that was injected into their back. The problem is once you've injected it into their back, you can't get it back out. So then they would develop this chronic urticaria and it wouldn't go away. It was real difficult. So they, people would come in and ask to be tested for it before they would undergo the nucleolysis. For a while, they also put papain in uh, contact lens cleaner. Yeah, yeah. And you get a contact dermatitis or, or conjunctivitis mm -hmm. from the papain. You can buy it as Adolf's meat tenderizer in the store. I think the, the biggest problem that I Adolf. have, is, you know, you have when you when you someone comes in, and they even bring labels and stuff. But but the the stuff in the in the foods looks like stuff they've been eating all along. But then it has the bottom thing says natural flavorings or whatever, which you don't know what that is. And one of our fellows, you mentioned gum. One of our fellows um, actually um, started chewing this gum. It was mojito flavored gum, and 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 he he. Um, um, was in the clinic one day, had a piece, and started chewing it, and within 15 minutes broke out in hives on his face. And he thought this was just a coincidence because he got hives on your face and he started itching a little bit and all this stuff. So he took some Benadryl and stopped chewing the gum or whatever, and, and, and he said, well, I drink mojitos, you know, I go out to the bar and drink mojitos all the time. Why, why should I, be? I have gum? I've, you know, chewed gum before. And um, so he decides he's going to do one day in afternoon clinic when we're all there. He goes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a challenge right now so everybody can treat me if I need it. And so he takes another piece of gum out and starts chewing it. Lo and behold, you know, like 10 minutes later, his face is breaking out hives again. And um, so he gets, so I, he goes, well, I want to be able to have gum. What's in this thing? And so he puts the package and then again, you can't, you know, it seems like all artificial ingredients and it says natural flavoring. So I said, call the company. So I called the consumer hotline for the company. And um, he, he said, um, you know, I, 
um, I've had this reaction to this gum, and I'm trying to figure out what. Can you tell me what the natural flavorings are um, for this? And um, and the lady goes, no, that's a trade secret or something. And he goes, well, she goes, you're going to have to go see an allergist. She goes, I am an allergist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So I need to know whether they ever tell. No, they don't. It's got the secret sauce. You never know. Uh, aspartame is another one. In the early '90s, it when it came out, it was a sweetener that was good for diet foods instead of saccharin, which had kind of a bitter aftertaste. Um, the problem is people got the headaches, and then a lot of parents started complaining that their kids developed ADHD, <laughs> hyperactivity. <laughs> it's not clear if that's the case or not, because you know, parents really want to find a cause for ADHD, and they'll blame pretty much thing. anything, including soft drinks. If they drank the, the, the Cokes with the sugar, they'd blame the sugar for it, and if they drank the aspartame, they'd blame the aspartame. There's no real evidence that it causes ADHD, and it was never confirmed, but it was all often suspected by parents who wanted something. Uh, protein hydrolysate, it really depends on how high, highly hydrolysated it is. If it's mm -hmm. broken down into amino acids, it's not going to be a problem, but if you take casein and break it into chunks, but the chunks are big enough, they can still bind IgE, so it may not be totally gone. Is yeah. the one with phenylalanine in it? Uh, that's that. Yes, no, aspartame is the one that yes. if you have yeah, it. Yeah, it's phenylalanine, so if you have phenylketonuria, then you should avoid but Oh, there, right. There was another thing with the aspartame is, is that um, the there was a controversy that was started that people were trying to blame um, aspartame for um, patients or for military guys who came back from Desert Storm in the early 90s because they were shipping all this um, soda pop um, over to over you know to um, the Middle East and it was it was so hot that basically they thought the heat was changing something the aspartame and causing some chemicals to be released and the other thing is that part of this that if you look at the um, all these um, like the soda pop that has aspartame or or um, some, well, even with Splenda, I think they all have now expiration dates on the bottles. They used to, they never had that when I was a kid for for soda, just regular well, soda. Spartan wasn't around when you were a kid. Yeah, oh. no, no, but I mean for but for regular soda pop, <laughs> we never had. There was never any expiration date on the bottle. Isolated of from tomatoes, it's a chemical that was a natural sweetener, and that's why they thought it would be uh, helpful because it tastes sweet, but it's just a couple of amino acids, so it doesn't have a lot of calories, it does spontaneously break down or oxidize or some, something changes in it. So after a couple of weeks, aspartame is no longer sweet. So if you buy a diet uh, soft drink that has aspartame as a sweetener and you sit it in your garage for a few weeks or a month or so, it's no longer sweet. So it really does have a short shelf life that needs to be consumed. What surprised me is that when soft drinks are manufactured, like uh, Coke or Pepsi, uh, for the most part, they're consumed within a week of their manufacture. I didn't realize that it was that fast. They ship them out, put in the store, they're purchased, and they're consumed within a week wow. on average. It's that fast. The turnover of soft drinks is just amazing. You, you, you know, if you've had, if you drink diet soda, you know you have a bad batch of soda <laughs> when you get that. And you open it up and it's like the it best part of the gum you had. It's like, it's like, it's like the, the nitrates are in... Uh, uh, foods like hot dogs and bologna and things like that, and they, they've been if you, they're, they've been associated with colon cancer. So there's some concern about that too, especially highly cooked foods where these nitrates get oxidized. It's it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, nitrates when you cook them turn into nitrosamines, and nitrosamines have been associated with lots maybe of bad stuff. Lactose um, is not an allergen; it's a lactose. Tolerance, but it's isolated from milk. So people say, "Oh, it's milk. I'm allergic to milk." But it's actually not an allergen. It's just if you have lactose tolerance, it's an issue. And then peanut oil. Patients always want to know if they're allergic to peanut. Can they eat peanut oil or things fried in it? If it's highly refined oil, yes, they can. It's not mm -hmm. allergen. The protein's been removed, so they can go to Chick Fil A. Yeah, I don't know about that one. You have to watch it out if it's cold pressed or or or. or if it's cold pressed, it's less refined because it's it's kind of like you know they just took the like the olives or whatever or the peanuts and they squished them, got the oil out. But it's and highly so refined. Yeah. Yeah. It's highly it's refined. Just, well, if it was not, then yeah. there have been reports because yeah. it's just the oil and they have the. Yeah. That so, uh, chloride is a detergent. Uh, it emulsifies things that are not normally soluble in in water. It's anionic and therefore it uh, causes a reaction. What you want is a neutral. 
uh, detergent rather than an, an ionic uh, detergent. So uh, that, that's the reason why it's, a, it's more of an irritant than an, than an allergen, but it's used in a lot of medications to emulsify or solubilize uh, otherwise insoluble products. So it's very interesting. So thank you very much. We're going to have to stop there. Um, we don't have a conferences online on uh, allergy and cola at 11 o'clock, so uh, we're going to be stopping there. I noticed a lot of people just joined us. Maybe you thought that uh, it was 10 o'clock instead of 11. The food allergy presentation was at 10 o'clock, so just completing that. But if you've joined us hoping to uh, view or participate in the food allergy presentation, this was a great presentation. We thank Dr. Roger for this. It will be edited and posted on YouTube and iTunes in the near future, so you can take a look at it. Um, but we're going to stop here because we don't have an 11 o'clock uh, conferences online allergy. Um, so with that said, I want to thank Dr. Raji for this great presentation. We're going to end there. Have a great weekend, everybody. Um, we'll see you on Monday for our next conferences online allergy. So see you next time. Bye-bye.